Hello, doctors. To discuss to you cardiovascular and JVP examination. On this first part of my lecture, I will be discussing to you cardiovascular physiology and common symptoms. The heart contracts and relaxes rhythmically, creating a two basic cardiac cycle, systole and diastole. During systole, the ventricles contract, ejecting blood from the left ventricle into the aorta, and simultaneously from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. During diastole, the ventricles dilate, drawing blood into the ventricles as the atria contract, thereby moving blood from the atria to the ventricles. As systole begins, ventricular contraction raises the pressure in the ventricles and forces the mitral and tricuspid valves closed, preventing backflow. This valve closure produces the first heart sound, or your S1, which is the characteristic lub. The intraventricular pressure rises until it exceeds that in the aorta and pulmonary aort artery. Then the aortic and pulmonic valves are forced open, and ejection of blood into the arteries begins. Valve opening is usually a silent event. When the ventricles are almost empty, the pressure in the ventricle falls below that in the aorta and pulmonary artery, allowing the aortic and pulmonic valves to close. Closure of these valves causes the second heart sound, or what you call S2, the dub. The second heart sound has two components. A2 is produced by aortic valve closure, and P2 is produced by pulmonic valve closure. As ventric ventricular pressure falls below the atrial pressure, the mitral and tricuspid valves open to allow the blood collected in the atria to refill the relaxed ventricles. Diastole is a relatively passive interval until ventricular filling is almost complete. The filling sometimes produces a third heart sound, or S3. Then the atria contract to ensure the ejection of any remaining blood, and this can sometimes be heard as the fourth heart sound, or S4. The cycle begins anew with ventricular contraction and atrial filling occurring at about the same time. The cardiac cycle continues without resting and constantly adjusts to the variable demands of work, rest, digestion, and illness. An intrinsic electrical conduction system enables the heart to contract and coordinate the sequence of muscular contractions taking place during the cardiac cycle. An electrical impulse stimulates each myocardial contraction. The impulse originates in and is paced by the sinoatrial node, or SA node, located in the wall of the right atrium. The impulse then travels through both atria to the atrioventricular node, or your AV node, which is located in the atrial septum. In the AV node, the impulse is delayed but then passes down the bundle of his to the Purkinje fibers, which are your heart muscle cells specialized for electrical conduction dislocated in the ventricular myocardium. Ventricular contraction is initiated at the apex and proceeds towards the base of the heart. An electrocardiogram is a graphic recording of electrical activity during the cardiac cycle. The ECG records electrical current generated by the movement of ions in and out of the myocardial cell membranes. The ECG records two basic events, depolarization, 
which is the spread of a stimulus through the heart muscle, and repolarization, which is the return of the, the stimulated heart muscle to a resting state. The ECG records electrical activity as specific waves. P wave signifies the spread of a stimulus through the atria, or also known as atrial depolarization. Your PR interval signifies the time from initial stimulation of the atria to initial stimulation of the ventricles, and is usually 0.12 to 0.20 second. QRS complex signifies the spread of a stimulus through the ventricles or your ventricular depolarization, which is less than 0.12 second. ST segment and T wave signifies the return of stimulated ventricular muscle to a resting state, or known as ventricular repolarization. U wave, this is a small deflection rarely seen just after the T wave. This is thought to be related to repolarization of the Purkin G fibers. They are commonly seen with bradycardia. This is also seen sometimes with electrolyte abnormalities, hypothermia, and hypothyroidism. QT interval. It signifies the time elapsed from the onset of ventricular depolarization until the completion of ventricular repolarization. The interval varies with the cardiac rate. The following are the common or concerning symptoms of patients with cardiovascular disease. Chest pain, palpitation, shortness of breath, swelling, and syncope. Chest pain is one of the most serious of all patient complaints and is the most common symptom of coronary heart disease. In a patient presenting with chest pain, always consider life-threatening diseases such as myocardial infarction, dissecting aortic aneurysm, and pulmonary embolus. Always remember that we do not always attribute chest pain with cardiac disease. Always consider as part of your differential diagnosis pulmonary causes of chest pain such as pleuritic chest pain secondary to pneumonia. Also consider gastro-related such as gastroesophageal reflux disease and musculoskeletal such as costochondritis and integumentary such as herpes zoster. Women, particularly those over age 65, Elderly patients and diabetics are more likely to report atypical symptoms that may go unrecognized, such as upper back, neck or jaw pain, shortness of breath, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, nausea or vomiting, and fatigue. Palpitation is another symptom of cardiac disease. This is an unpleasant awareness of the heartbeat. And there are terms that our patients use to describe their palpitations. Some will say skipping, racing, pounding, or stopping of the heart. Palpitation does not necessarily mean heart disease. Shortness of breath is a common patient concern that can represent dyspnea or stopnia or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Dyspnea is defined as difficulty of breathing. Lying down increases volume of intrathoracic blood and the weakened heart cannot accommodate the increased load. Orthopnea is dyspnea that occurs when the patient is supine and improves when the patient sits up. Classically, it is quantified by the number of pillows the patient uses for sleeping or by the fact that the patient needs to sleep sitting up. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea describes episodes of sudden dyspnea and orthopnea that awaken the patient from sleep, usually one or two hours after going to bed, 
prompting the patient to sit up, stand up, or go to a window for air. Swelling refers to the accumulation of excessive fluid in the extravascular interstitial space. You need to differentiate if the edema is either systemic or local because the management will differ. What are the simple questions you can ask from your patient suspected of edema? This would include asking, do your shoes get tight? Are the rings tight on your finger? Are your eyelids puffy or swollen in the morning? Have you had to let out your belt? Have your clothes gotten tight around the middle? What are the possible causes of bilateral edema that should be considered as part of the differential diagnosis? It could be cardiac in cases of heart failure, hepatic in cases of liver cirrhosis, renal in cases of chronic renal failure, and nutritional in cases of protein malnutrition. Syncope or fainting is a transient loss of consciousness followed by recovery. Being the most common cause of syncope is neurocardiogenic, also called as vasovagal syncope. Most importantly, in a patient with syncope, always consider cardiac origin from arrhythmias. There are other symptoms that might be related to cardiovascular disease, and this includes cough that might be due to edema of the pulmonary vasculature or pulmonary congestion, fatigue due to decreased cardiac output states, as well as cyanosis or pallor, and nocturia, wherein recumbency at night promotes fluid reabsorption and excretion. And this occurs with heart failure in the person who is ambulatory during the day. Other than the symptoms of the patient, it is important to know the past medical cardiac history of the patient by asking any history of hypertension, elevated cholesterol or triglyceride levels, valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease, rheumatic fever or unexplained joint pains as child or youth, recurrent tonsillitis, and results of previous diagnostic tests including ECG to the echo, serum cholesterol measurement, and other tests. Family cardiac history will include asking family history of hypertension, obesity, diabetes, coronary artery disease, and sudden death at younger age. Checking the personal habits by asking about the nutrition history, describing the usual diet, usual weight, or any recent weight change. Smoking history by asking the number of cigarettes smoked per day, and how many years was the patient have been smoking. Alcohol intake by asking the type and volume of alcohol consumed and how long has the patient been taking alcohol. Chronic alcohol intake may cause alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Exercise and drug intake, especially the use of antihypertensives, diuretics, blood thinners, or street drugs.